goodness, has appointed the officers of rulers and councils for the welfare of society and the just government of man. We beseech thee to behold with thy abundant favor us thy servants, whom thou hast been pleased to call to the performance of such important trust in the Commonwealth of Dominica. Let thy blessing descend upon us here in this parliament assembled, and grant that we may, as in thy presence, treat and consider all matters that shall come under our deliberation in so just and faithful a manner as to promote thy honor and glory, and to advance the good of those whose interests thou hast committed to our charge. All which we ask in the name and for the sake of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. be adopted as circulated. Seconded, Madam Speaker. It has been moved and seconded that the order paper be adopted as circulated. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. I will now suspend the sitting of the House to receive His Excellency and I ask members to stand.
please be seated. I will now ask His Excellency to address us. Madam Speaker, Honorable Prime Minister, Honorable Members of the House of Assembly, my wife and I express sincere appreciation and thanks for the invitation extended to us to attend this sitting of Parliament and the invitation extended to me to address this Honorable House at the first meeting of the fifth session of the eighth Parliament under the 1978 Independence Constitution of the Commonwealth of Dominica. Having sat <clears throat> in this honorable house as a member both on the government and opposition benches from 1979 to 1985 and again from 1995 to 2013, that is cumulatively for 24 years, I have a great respect for the Constitution and the institutions and offices established by the Constitution, including this Honorable House of Assembly. I therefore wish to take this privilege accorded to me to address this Honorable House to focus on a matter which I consider to be most relevant at this and any other time, that is, understanding the major challenges facing Dominica and small island developing states in general. Later in the year, our nation will celebrate its 36th anniversary of independence, an event in our history that many now take for granted. When our independence took effect on November 3, 1978, the nation embarked on a journey to build a free and independent society on the principles of parliamentary democracy and the rule of law. All the countries in the British Commonwealth of Nations and the Francophonie had preceded us in a post-World War II exercise of political freedom from colonial peoples. For many of them, both large and small, some with an abundance of natural resources and others woefully deficient of such resources, it has not been an easy journey. The story has been one mixed with successes and failures, promises, disappointments, and betrayals. Madam Speaker, in this milieu of now independent states, once part of colonial empires, sits the Commonwealth of Dominica, a small island developing state, one of 52 states so categorized under the United Nations system. The United Nations Committee for Development Policy has noted that there is no accepted definition of a small island developing state. These range in size from Nauru, about eight square miles, with a population of some 13,000, to Papua New Guinea, 128,703 square miles, with a population of 7,059,000, 660. In fact, there are some 24 independent states geographically smaller than Dominica, and 11 with a smaller population. However, the committee notes that these states share high levels of intrinsic vulnerabilities, especially to external shocks, and it goes on to comment that the high levels of vulnerability of the natural, economic, and social systems of the seeds arise from the following characteristics. Small size, remoteness, vulnerability to external, that is demand and supply side shocks, narrow resource base, and exposure to global environmental challenges. Dominica, 
and indeed all member states of the OECS and of the wider CARICOM possesses the characteristics thus enumerated. Madam Speaker, members of this Honorable House, the message I intend to share today seeks to draw your attention to the major challenges Dominica has to confront since independence and will have to contend with constantly to a lesser or greater degree. In doing so, I will endeavor to briefly identify some of the initiatives we have taken as a nation which has the potential to accelerate our continued development. I will also propose a qualitative turnaround in how we treat with each other in order to overcome future challenges and to take advantage of new opportunities. Unlike some states which made the journey from colonialism to independence, we did not have to engage in warfare with a, with a mother country to gain our independence, nor, as in the case of some of our brother African states, did we have to overcome tribal and internecine conflicts on the way to independence. Though not lacking in heated debates on some of the provisions of the early drafts of the Constitution, ours was a relatively smooth transition, most likely because the two dominant political parties of the day were fundamentally in agreement on the country's move towards independence. Though not unique to small island states, our first challenge in the transition to independence surrounded an effort to assert our freedom to chart our own course of development in the context of the Dominica Constitution Order of 1978. Thus, we were and still are the only Commonwealth Caribbean state to opt for a Republican system of government on attaining independence with the president as head of state elected by our parliament instead of a, government, a governor general appointed by the Queen of England. Soon after independence, however, proposals to carve out some 45 square miles in the north of Dominica to establish a free port zone under the control of a dubious American corporation, Sunday Island Port Authority, was approved by the government which had brought us into independence. This did not sit well with the Dominican citizenry who, in spite of their dire need for infrastructural development, jobs, and housing, were not about to allow their government to sell their national patrimony to anyone. National opposition to this proposal was widespread, and the government of the day was left with no option but to withdraw from this ill-advised escapade. This was not the only outrageous scheme that the government of the day was severely criticized for. And in May of 1979, two pieces of legislation were proposed to be tabled in Parliament to counter such criticism. These, however, did not meet the approval of the trade unions and the general public. The first was the Industrial Relations Amendment Act, and the second, the Libel and Slander Amendment Act. The first was vigorously opposed by public servants and workers in the essential services and the Joint Trade Union Working Committee who saw in this act an attempt to stamp out their right to full collective bargaining processes. The second, though directed at the local media, was generally criticized by the private sector and the general population as it was aimed at restricting the freedom of the media to report and comment on matters critical of the government. These two pieces of legislation were seen as the straw that broke the camel's back for the newly independent Dominican people. They triggered a coalition of forces of differing persuasions. The churches, the trade unions, the private sector, and youth organizations and the political opposition. This coalition found expression in the Committee for National Salvation. The CNS provided leadership and support for the parliament, that is, 
both sides of the House to move and approve a motion of no confidence in the government, which was led by Patrick Roland John, the first Prime Minister under the Constitution of a newly independent Dominica, and to establish an interim government led by former Minister for Agriculture, Oliver Serafin, who was the first minister to resign from the cabinet as a result of political opposition to the two pieces of legislation. The next and perhaps most formidable challenge the young nation had to confront in the aftermath of this constitutional crisis was presented by nature and not by man. On August 29, 1979, the winds of Hurricane David descended on Dominica. Many were caught flat-footed and had no time to carry out the preparatory and mitigating measures that have become the norm of today. David left in its wake death and widespread destruction of property on a scale unknown to us in living memory. However, it was in the post-disaster period that the metal of the Dominican spirit rose forth. Communities and neighborhoods rallied together and truly become, became each other's keeper. Sharing and giving became the order of the day as the less severely affected opened up their homes and their lives to those who in their neighborhoods who had suffered greater loss. Were Quintus Septimus Florence Tertullianus the early Christian author of the first century around at that time, he would have said of us, as he did of the early Christian community, and I quote, see how they love one another, unquote. The government which emerged following the general election of 1980 was charged with the responsibility of not only rebuilding a battered country, but in placing it on a path towards sustainable development. The new nation continued to struggle with the aftermath of Hurricane David. The country was just beginning to settle down under the new government elected in 1980, when with the collaboration of international security agencies, evidence of a coup plot emerged. There was widespread fear and anxiety when nationals learned that members of the racist Ku Klux Klan were in cahoots with local agents for an armed invasion of the country and the overthrow of the newly elected government. The coup plotters, both in the United States, Canada, and locally, were arrested and brought to justice. The dust had barely settled on this period of national turmoil when there was yet another coup attempt. This was led by some former officers of the disbanded defense force who actually attacked the police headquarters and the prisons. This second attempt at the violent overthrow of the popular elected government was quickly suppressed by the police with the support of the people. Madam Speaker, members of this honorable house, there is a generation of our citizenry for whom these events may sound as a, a storyline taken out of an action-packed movie. In fact, there is a movie option based on a book recounting the events of the early days of our independence entitled The Bayou of Pigs, recalling the unsuccessful invasion of Cuba, generally referred to as the Bay of Pigs. This younger generation was born into a country where for decades they have enjoyed peace and security and have been beneficiaries of all the freedoms that characterize a modern democratic society. Lest they and the rest of the citizenry forget, the freedoms that we all take for granted were earned through the blood of some and the pain sacrifice, struggle, and bravery of many. The disasters, conflicts, and tensions 
that accompanied our introduction into the business of nation building post-independence can be seen as having contributed to the resilience and unflappability displayed by the majority of our citizens. These qualities give credence to the observation of the Swiss psychiatrist and psychoanalyst Carl Gustav Jung that, and I quote, the most intense conflicts, if overcome, leave behind a sense of security and calm that is not easily disturbed. It is just these intense conflicts and their conflagration which are needed to produce valuable and lasting results." End of quote. There are countless examples around the world of such conflicts, but they all have one thing in common. No one wants a repetition. In other words, Madam Speaker, once is enough. Madam Speaker, members of this Honorable House, I dare to suggest that the valuable and lasting results, that is, a sense of security and calm confidence emanating from our confrontation of disaster and the political upheaval in the past, were evident in the next two major challenges Dominica has face. I refer to the rising effects of the erosion of the banana industry, once the bedrock of our economy, and to the challenge to fiscal and economic governance, creating both from within and without. The former had the effect of displacing some 6,000 farmers and farm workers, thus placing their livelihoods and that of their dependents at risk. This near calamity triggered responses by way of public policy that saw the reorientation of the economy from a basic monocrop economy, dependent almost entirely on bananas, to a more diversified economy where services, particularly tourism services, have assumed a new importance and introduction of social protection interventions of a magnitude and scope never before witnessed in Dominica. The effectiveness of these responses are best validated in one of the conclusions of the Caribbean Development Bank commissioned country poverty assessment reports, which states that the significant decrease in poverty that occurred between 2001 and 2009 was due to these interventions coupled with an intense public sector investment program. Madam Speaker, Members of this Honorable House, the state of the economy in 2001 called for the introduction of austerity measures that affected every working person in Dominica. All were called to make financial sacrifices and everyone responded with understanding and with the hope of a better future. The discipline gained through the introduction of firm and responsible fiscal policy from 2000 positioned Dominica to mitigate to some extent the effects of what is called the global financial and economic crisis which erupted towards the end of 2008. This crisis, which is not fully abated, caused deep reversals in the fiscal and growth targets of developed and developing countries alike. It has virtually made obsolete the notion of a job for life as one of its effects has been massive layoff of workers in both the private and public sectors of the countries affected, including the traditionally stronger economies in the Caribbean. I hereby submit to this honorable house that there are two important lessons that should have been learned from the last two challenges I have described. The first is that public policy that is realistic and which responds to the real as opposed to perceived needs of our citizens and communities presents a winning formula. The second is that the execution of public policy requires a workforce and leadership that is disciplined, committed, and motivated always to perform to the highest professional standards. While there appears to be general consensus 
that greater efforts need to be made in increasing productivity in the public and the private sectors, we can take some satisfaction in the fact that when the going gets tough, the people of Dominica spare no effort in steadying the ship of state. Madam Speaker, our past triumphs over adversity should give our citizens the confidence that we can overcome whatever challenges the future may hold and challenges there will be. As our nation comes of age and we face the future, our citizens would be advised to guard against the error of allowing past inadvertence to impede the grasping of opportunities on which we could build a better future for all. Let us be guided by the wisdom contained in the words of the great British statesman Sir Winston Churchill, who in an effort to forestall the corrosive effects of the playing of the blame game after the massive loss of British lives in the Battle of Dunkirk, declared to the nation, and I quote, if we open a quarrel between the past and the present, then we shall find that we have lost the future, unquote. Whether it is in education, in housing, in water management and distribution, in infrastructural development, in health care, or in the thrust to secure cheaper, cleaner, reliable, and renewable sources of energy as a basis to attract new enterprises and grow existing ones, our nation has made substantial investment in the future. The high cost of fossil fuel as a primary means of generating electricity has a most debilitating impact on the quality of life and economic activity in energy deficient economies. We in Dominica, for instance, spend over $40 million per annum on importing diesel for generating electricity. When coupled with the challenges of our topography and its impact on distribution costs, we have one of the highest costs per kilowatt hour of electricity in the entire region. It is a national imperative, therefore, to develop alternative and renewable sources of energy. And in this regard, geothermal holds the greatest promise not only in reducing the unit cost of electricity to the consumer, but also the possibility of exporting electricity to our neighboring islands. Thus, in this and other regards, our maturity as a nation will be judged by our ability to press the mute key on the key things, on the few things on which we differ and concentrate our energies and resources in grasping and molding the many opportunities for progress which are now on our doorsteps. Madam Speaker, members of this Honorable House, just as Dominica, our OECS and CARICOM member states are all small island developing states. Therefore, I shall direct my concluding remarks to the unique challenges common to SEEDS. <clears throat> the unique challenges facing small island developing states within the context of sustainable development were first formally recognized by an international community at the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development, UNSED, also known as the Earth Summit, held in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, in 1992. Two years later, the first UN Conference on SEEDS, which took place in Barbados, adopted the Barbados Program of Action for the Sustainable Development of SEEDS. The conference reaffirmed that as a result of a series of challenges facing these 52 small island developing states, 43 of which are located in the Caribbean and the Pacific regions, they are highly disadvantaged in their development process and require special support from the international community and donor agencies. Since the international meeting in Mauritius in 2005, significant progress has been achieved concerning the vulnerability of small island developing states. The Millennium Development Goals Report of 2009 noted this progress, but also highlighted the importance of renewed and sustainable and sustained action, especially in light of the high vulnerability 
of the natural economic and social systems of the aforementioned group of countries. This vulnerability comes as a result of the intrinsic characteristics of seeds, included but not limited to small size, remoteness, vulnerability to external shocks, narrow resource base, and exposure to global environmental challenges referred to earlier. Such findings have given rise to the level of urgency to find additional solutions to the major challenges facing small island developing states. On the 24th of February 2014, the United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon launched the United Nations International Year of Small Island Developing States and announced that the third international conference on small island developing states will be held from the 1st to the 4th of September this year in Apia, Samoa. The Secretary General explicitly affirmed that, quote, the challenges facing small island developing states are challenges that confront us all, and all of us must be determined to find solutions that will ensure a brighter future for generations to come. This appeal should encourage all of us in this country to think positively and to stir all of us on to action. As a people, we should be inspired to find creative and innovative ways to deal with the challenges facing us in this unique island of ours and to achieve greater success. It is anticipated that the SEEDS Conference will focus the world's attention on a group of countries, including Dominica and other Caribbean islands, that remain a special case for sustainable development in view of their unique and particular vulnerabilities. Research has shown that the issue of climate change remains a looming threat to daily life for small island developing states. Dominica, like other Caribbean islands, knows well the bitter experiences of hurricanes and storms that regularly batter our region. For example, the devastating effects caused by abnormal weather conditions in December of last year was an eye opener. It undoubtedly showed that in this country, our vulnerability to climate change is a major cause for concern and there is no room for complacency. Dominica, like other Caribbean islands, is prone to hurricanes and other natural disasters such as earthquakes, torrential rains, flash flooding, landslides, beach erosion, occasional extended dry seasons, etc., which impact heavily on the natural environment. Environmental problems are critical challenges of seeds due to a number of factors, some due to natural forces, others brought about as a result of economic development. In these small island states, increased demand for residential housing, tourism structure, and industrial buildings, and expanded road infrastructure have given rise to a fast depletion of undeveloped land. Waste management is, of course, a problem faced by most countries undergoing development, but the effect on SIDS is likely to be much stronger due to the small size of these countries. Although natural disasters occur in all types of countries, the impact of a natural disaster on a small island economy is expected to be relatively larger in terms of damage per unit of area and costs per capita due to the small size of the country's territory and relatively high population density. In some instances, natural disasters threaten the very survival of some small islands through, for example, the devastation of the agricultural sector, the wiping out of entire village settlements, the disruption of a high proportion of communication services, and injury or death of a relatively high percentage of inhabitants. With very few exceptions, most seeds are major sources of international migration. This deprives a country of origin of qualified human resources, since the migrants 
tend to be the better educated in their most productive years. However, migration is also accompanied by remittances which have a major beneficial effect. In Dominica's case, for instance, it is estimated that there are between 120,000 and 160,000 first generation Dominicans, that is persons actually born in Dominica, living abroad in the diaspora. In light of these challenges, we in those small island developing states are left with no choice but to find creative and innovative ways to reinvent and or strengthen our resilience. Thus, we must continue to focus our attention on the importance of improving the country's economic growth. Achieving and sustaining growth and development in small nations like Dominica is a complex and demanding task. This can be achieved only through the combined efforts of nationals at home and abroad and an enhanced economic base in which more resilient activities will play a greater role. In this context, resilience building requires sustained investment efforts in education and training, energy independence, and infrastructure to diversify productive capacities, notably in the sphere of services and in activities with a greater value added and knowledge content. Madam Speaker, honorable members, let me conclude by extending to all members of this honorable house my very best wishes for your continued good health and to once again thank you for the courtesy of your kind attention. I thank you. I will now take leave of His Excellency, Mr. Charles Savory and Mrs. Savory. You stand, please. House resumes. Madam Speaker, I move 
that uh, message of thanks be extended to His Excellency, to His Excellency President, for what we consider to have been a very uh, well-crafted and presented speech to this parliament. Thank you. Seconded, Madam Speaker. It has been moved and seconded that a message of thanks be forwarded to His Excellency the President. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Of minutes of the meeting of 1st July 2014. Madam Speaker, I move that the minutes of the meeting of Tuesday, 1st July 2014, be confirmed as circulated. Seconded. It has been moved and seconded that the minutes of the meeting of the House of 1st July 2014 be confirmed as circulated. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Announcements by Speaker. I will be very brief because we have a long um, morning ahead of us. I would like to though it would be remiss of me if I didn't thank the many Dominicans who came forward and requested invitations to come to this parliament. I thank you for your interest and I hope that the seats assigned to you were what you expected, which is of course a very difficult thing given the few seats that we have and the numerous requests that we received this time around. I would also like to thank um, Sat and Mapin for collaborating once again so readily with GIS in providing coverage for these proceedings. I, I do believe that they um, earn, have earned a round of applause since they do this as national service. <laughs> this is the end of my announcements for now. Of papers. Madam Speaker, I beg to lay the following papers on the table. One, Proclamation Proroguing Parliament, SRO number 21 of 2014. Two, Proclamation Reconvening Parliament, SRO number 22 of 2014. Three, Draft Estimates of Revenue and Expenditure for the financial year 2014-2015. Four, economic and social re review for fiscal year 2013-2014. Five, group and social protection strategy for 2014 to 2018. And six, Dominica's Social Security 2013 annual report. Madam Speaker, be it resolved, sorry, be it resolved that this Honorable House approves the estimates of expenditure for the financial year ending June 30, 2015, amounting to 489 million 980 dollars, the details of which are contained in the draft estimates of the Commonwealth of Dominica for the year ending June 30, 2015.
Madam Speaker, members of this House, my fellow Dominicans, I am thankful to God for the opportunity to once again present a budget address to the nation and to outline the policies and programs that this government wishes to implement for the growth and development of our country and for the benefit and prosperity of our people. Let me also say thanks to the many friends, supporters, and well-wishers of the government for your encouragement, support, and acknowledgement of the work that we have been doing. My gratitude also goes out to the members of cabinet and the parliamentary secretaries for your human service they render as together we apply our minds and energies to the challenges we encounter as we strive to take the to higher levels of development. Madam Speaker, this is my 11th budget presentation. When I presented the 2004 budget address, it was at a time when we were implementing the, an IMF-supported structural adjustment program. That program was necessary because of the poor economic and fiscal and financial management of the United Workers' Party government during the term of office from 1995 to early 2000. With the diligence and hard work of this Labour Party government, led in the first year of the program by the late Pierre Charles, the sacrifices of the people of Dominica, our resilience as a nation, and the support of our bilateral and multilateral partners, we came through this program with flying colors. <laughs> to the extent that the Labour Party was returned to office in 2005 and again in 2009. At this time, Madam Speaker, challenges remain. But these are challenges caused by a global crisis, which first started with the financial crisis in 2008, a crisis that has changed the global economic landscape and which has left no country unscathed. For all of this term of government, we have been operating in difficult times. But despite this, we have continued to focus on the development of our country and our citizens. We have made prudent fiscal management the platform on which our growth strategies are built and have put measures in place to make our debt sustainable. Not only have we maintained social programs, but we have gone further and increased support to the disadvantaged among us. We have done our best despite the challenges, but the challenges persist. However, these are challenges that we are resolved to overcome. What is needed is determination to stay the course, remain focused, and work toward delivering the results that are virtually assured in the package of projects and programs for which financing has been secured. The fundamental message I wish to leave with listeners and all those who will be charged with implementing these policies is that we cannot guarantee the social protection and standard of living we have hitherto enjoyed unless we all become more enterprising put our shoulders to the plow, and create employment and wealth from the human and material resources with which we are endowed. Madam Speaker, we have therefore decided to present this budget statement around the theme towards expansion. Through this theme, we will develop a diversified approach to sustainable economic recovery and social development to take us out of this prolonged global recession and into an era of prosperity. Quoting from the International Monetary Fund, IMF, World Economic Outlook of April 2014, the progress 
for growth in the global economy is that, and I quote, global activity strengthened during the second half of 2013 and is expected to improve further in 2014-2015, end quote. Global growth is expected to strengthen to 3.6% in 2014 and then to increase further to 3.9% in 2015. Much of that growth is expected to come from advanced economies. The United States of America is expected to register growth of about two and three quarter percent. Growth is projected to be but varied in the Eurozone. In emerging markets and developing economies, economic activity is projected to improve gradually, with growth increasing from 4.7% in 2013 to about 5% in 2014 and five and a quarter percent in 2015. In China, growth is projected to remain at about 7.5% in 2014. The IMF also indicates that economic activity in Latin America and the Caribbean is expected to remain relatively subdued in 2014. Real GDP growth in Latin America and the Caribbean fell, fell further in 2013 to 2 and 3 quarter percent, down from 3 percent in 2012 and 4 and a half percent in 2011. In 2014, growth is projected to remain low at about 2.5 percent. Among members of the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union, growth is expected to be subdued with growth from, for the union estimated at 0 0.8 for 2013 and projected to be 1.9 percent and 2.3 percent in 2014 and 2015 respectively. According to the ECCB, these estimates reflect improved performance but that level of growth is not nearly enough to generate the type of economic and social transformation countries of the ECCU require. However, these results are not surprising given the impact which the global crisis has had on each territory. There are risks associated with these projections, not least of which is the potential for increases in petroleum prices as a result of the political climate in the Middle East. There's also the risk of increasing competition in the global marketplace as the emerging powers, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, the BRICS, get the act together. It is clear that in this environment, we have to become more enterprising and develop the capacity to spot niches and capitalize on them quickly. Madam Speaker, this is an election period. As constantly all things being equal, general elections will have to be called before the next budget is presented. But Madam Speaker, the necessity of an election does not mean that we deviate from the characteristics that are the hallmarks of this government of public finances economy generally. <laughs> After 11 years as Minister for Finance, I have not taken a gamble with the management of government resources, and from all reports, the fiscal policies of this government serve this country very well. Bioestimate, Madam Speaker, for the period 2009 to 2013, real GDP growth averaged 0.5%. The preliminary estimate gro growth for 2013 is 0.8%, while the estimate for 2014 is 1.5%. The estimate for 2013 will be confirmed on the completion of the 2014 National Account Survey. Our target for an annual average growth rate is set at 3%. The main contributors to that growth were agriculture, construction, manufacturing, and tourism. 
Madam Speaker, we are concerned that our expectation for growth in agriculture is being compromised by new and emerging diseases. Much has already been said about the black cigotoka and citrus greening disease. This is it. We have not stood by and ignored the problem. With a combination of measures, including the application of the necessary pesticides, cutting down of, in of infected fields, and obtaining new planting material, we expect to win the war over these diseases. At the same time, we are reassured that the policy to support horticulture is bearing fru fruit and keeping agriculture, the agricultural sector as a whole on a growth path. The construction sector has been supported through a series of government policies. The housing revolution has been a major factor in construction. Whether it was created through the special loan facilities at the aid bank and the government housing loan board, or through the housing and sanitation program, the construction sector has been positively impacted. The infrastructural work, works undertaken by government is likely the most significant contributor to the construction sector. In 2010, growth in that sector was estimated as high as 8.7%. However, it is estimated that output in the sector fell by 2% in 2013 because some large infrastructural projects were coming to an end. The tourism sector has seen mixed fortunes with growth from 2009-2013, averaging 1%, with a high of 8.2% in 2011, and a low of minus 4.1% in 2009. This sector is the one which has, been, which has been most directly affected by the global crisis, which started in 2008. Hence, the 2009 result is not surprising. This, along with the decrease of in cruise arrivals, meant that the level of growth desired in the tourism sector has not been achieved. However, preliminary estimates suggest that from a 1.6% decline in 2012, activity in the sector strengthened during 2013 with estimated growth of 2%. Activity within the manufacturing sector has remained positive for the last three years. Output has been robust with, a strong, with strong gains in soap, beverage, and paint production. In 2012, growth of 3.8% was recorded. In 2013, growth is, expect, is estimated at 3.4%. Growth for 2014 is expected to be 2%. The performance of the various subsectors change from time to time. But the imperative is always to identify the measures which will encourage growth. A review of growth rates for selected OECS countries revealed that Dominica has stood its own among the OECS states. Table 1 of the printed text provides comparative figures for the ECCU. Madam Speaker, the record of this government in regard to fiscal management is well known. There have been challenges created by external shocks, such as the impacts of the global financial crisis and weather-related events and disasters. Despite these, government continues to maintain fiscal discipline while safeguarding the poor and vulnerable. The challenge in the last five years was to find a balance between the necessary fiscal imperatives and meeting the growing needs of our citizens who are themselves feeling the effect of the global crisis. We sought to address this matter by building relationships and alliances with countries and institutions which share a common vision with us and through whom we were able to obtain financing in the form of grants and highly concessional loans to fund our development programs. Reaching a primary surplus target of 2.4% of GDP over the medium term remains our commitment. However, the balance that we sought resulted in varied results over the last five years. In the fiscal year 
the estimated outturn is a primary deficit of 0.7%, an outcome which bettered the previous year. Madam Speaker, debt management remains a core aspect of government's activities. When we came into office in 2000, the debt to GDP ratio was 130%, a situation that made it necessary to restructure the country's debt. In June 2014, government fully amortized the short bonds, which were issued as part of the debt restructuring in 2004, and we have begun the amortization of the immediate, intermediate bonds. Debt repayments remain among the top priorities of government's operations, and all debts are paid in a timely manner. At the end of fiscal year 2013-2014, central government debt totaled $862.5 million, or 75% of GDP. Of this, external debt was $632.4 million, $632 million and domestic debt was $230.1 million. Government borrowing is guided by its debt strategy. During the year, disbursements were received from various agencies and in, and in various currencies. Predominantly, disbursements were in the United States dollars, euro, and RMB. New debt contracted was US dollars from the Caribbean Development Bank, for emergency response to the, to the disaster in December 2013. The government of Dominica continues to participate on the Regional Government Securities Market, RGSM, as a means of obtaining cheaper financing. This also helps to build the Regional Securities Market. During the fiscal year 2013-2014, on two occasions, we obtained what has been the lowest rate of interest for the Treasury bills issued on the RGSM. That is 1.999%. All treasury bills issued by the government of Dominica have also been highly oversubscribed. Madam Speaker, we have successfully maintained our fiscal stance. The results and response to the issuance of, of government of Dominica instruments on the RGSM is testimony that the public at large shared the same view of our performance. Based on the instruments that were issued by, the, by all ECCU countries on the RGSM this year, the weighted average interest rate for the 91-day Treasury bill is 4.145%, with the highest rate being 5.748%. To obtain a rate of interest which is way below the average, is a vote of confidence in the government of Dominica and in its policies. <laughs> Government's focus has been consistent with that outline in the Growth and Social Protection Strategy, GSPS. Many initiatives, projects and programs were introduced towards the achievement of economic growth and poverty reduction. All of the budgets which were presented to the Parliament were based on the three major pillars of the GSPS, namely fiscal policy and administrative reform, sectoral strategies for growth, and strategies for poverty reduction and social protection. It is through the budget that we articulate and implement the programs for development and poverty reduction. Our review of the implementation of these budgets confirms that we can be proud of our achievements. What are some of these sectoral achievements? The truth is, Madam Speaker, if I had to present a complete list, we would be here for much, much more than the average of one and a half or two hours within which the budget address is presented. As a matter of fact, I would dare say we'll be here for several days. <laughs> I will still try to do justice to the remarkable performance by highlighting 
just a few of our successful interventions. The development agenda for tourism included site development, destination marketing, hotel development, and improving air access. The following are some of the achievements. A major achievement of the government is the introduction of night landing at the Melville Hall Airport. No longer are Dominicans returning home, and visitors who are journeying to Dominica forced to overnight in other jurisdictions because the main airport had to be closed by sunset. This particular achievement was welcomed by the majority of Dominicans who appreciate the convenience of being able to arrive in Dominica in one day. As a result of the investment in and installation of modern equipment, the airspace classification moved from G to D and transcended from the visual flight rule, VFR, to an instrumental flight rule, IFR, Aerodome. The air access strategy was developed in 2012 and the first ever air access conference was hosted on 25th to 27th September 2012. Outputs of the initiatives are the seamless transition from the American Eagle to Seaborne Airlines in April 2013. The seamless transition from ABVI to Winair, serving Dominica via St. Martin, and the most recent increase of up to 15,000 seats per year serving Dominica from Guadeloupe and St. Martin through a Winier and Air ATS joint venture. The Waitikubuli National Trail was completed and commissioned and now, now forms a major part of the tourism product. Government continues to be the major contributor to the hosting of the World Creole Music Festival. Visitor facilities have been improved, including the construction of new interpretation buildings at Capuchin and Marigot. Additional washroom facilities were built at Freshwater Lake and the Titu Gorge, and reception facilities were built at the Indian River, Watson Waven, and Bellevue Chopin. In addition, Madam Speaker, site rehabilitation works were undertaken at Soufre Sulphur Springs and Cabrits, and work were undertaken to enhance the interpretive centers at Emerald Pool, Emerald Pool Trafalgar Falls and the Midland Falls. With the concessions granted by government, 226 hotel rooms were upgraded to international standards. Training was administered to 212 tour guides and 276 taxi operators and 195 vendors were certified. Madam Speaker, the focus on agriculture has been an increasing has been on increasing production with the intention of increasing exports, encouraging import substitution, and achieving food security. This was pursued by providing support to farmers and fisher folk, especially in the context of combating certain diseases and the impact of weather conditions. Contractual delays in completing the construction of an abattoir have set back plans for growing the poultry and pork industries. However, Corrective measures have been taken and the abattoir will become operational during this financial year. To address the challenges of diseases in the supply sector, we have developed special programs and strengthened the capacity within the Ministry of Agriculture to respond. A citrus certification project was implemented to deal with the diseases affecting citrus. Disease-resistant varieties were introduced to replant the fields which were destroyed. For fiscal year 2013-2014, 3,571 citrus plants were distributed to 273 farmers. An aggressive plan was developed to deal with black seagull token. Infected fields were cut down and affected areas treated. With assistance available under the Banana Accompanying Measures Program, new disease-resistant varieties of bananas will be introduced in Dominica. The horticulture program introduced by the government has been very successful 
and has been largely responsible for the growth in the agricultural sector in the past five years. The non-banana crop sector is estimated to have grown by 6.4% and 13% in 2011 and 2012, respectively. An estimated 1,100 farmers have been assisted in establishing 560 acres of root and tree crops. An example, we note that yams are available practically all year round now, as compared to being seasonal. Under the arrangement with the government of Morocco, 4,300 one pound bags of fertilizer were distributed. 4,300 100 pound bags of fertilizer were distributed to farmers. This was used in the cultivation of various crops on a total acreage of 1,050. The horticulture program is supported by the expanded services provided through the Dominica China Horticulture Center, which was recently rebuilt in Portsmouth. The center is particularly helpful in the production of vegetables and the introduction of new varieties of fruits, vegetables, and flowers. Financing is always identified as a constraint to investing in agriculture. Government made available $2 million to operationalize the Direct Farm Investment Fund, which is managed by the Aid Bank, a credit facility with an initial capital of $600,000 was also made available at the National Development Foundation of Dominica, NDFD. Infrastructure in the form of construction of farm access roads in Calibishi, Vekas, Capuchin, Mont Prosper, Salisbury, Cochrane, Dalys, Wesley, Layou Valley, and River Civic was satisfactorily completed. Other investments include the erection of greenhouses and the construction of two multi-purpose park houses, as well as the National Center for Testing Excellence. These are intended to provide the support for the increasing production and marketing of agricultural projects. Among the other achievements in, in the sector is the support provided to fisher folk in the form of providing boats, engine, and fishing gear. The thrust towards clean and renewable energy is being pursued vigorously. The main objective is to reduce the cost of electricity to the benefit of households and also to attract new investment and support existing investments. We are pleased with our achievements to date in the drive to develop the geothermal potential of this country. In that regard, the specific achievements include the following. Three test wells were dug, confirming the viability of the geothermal resource. Two production wells were drilled. Successful flow testing of production well WWP1 carried out between 2014 and June 16, 2014. The production well WWP1 is capable of generating about 11.4 megawatts of electricity which is essentially enough supply to cover the existing base load of the country. While a technical work is ongoing, negotiations continue with interest partners for the construction of the plant, which in the first instance will provide energy for domestic purposes and ultimately for export. It is anticipated that a domestic plant will become operational by 2016. Madam Speaker, the introduction of technology in day-to-day -day operations is necessary if Dominica is to become and remain competitive in the delivery of services. Technology is a basic tool of development. According to the census data, 30% of 7,618 households have internet connection while 44.5% have access to internet. In comparison, over the last decade, 8.6% of households had internet connection. Households with personal computers recorded 9,449, or 37.7%, as compared to 2,885, or 12.7% 12 in 2001. These results are closely associated 
with the following. Mobile penetration moved from 137% in 2009 to 143% in 2013, while access to broadband increased by 4.1% in the same period. Government and other services can now be accessed through community internet access points in a number of communities. A total of over 480 computers, projectors, printers, networking equipment, and other accessories were distributed to over 20 schools on island. 11 primary schools participated in the pilot of primary school ICT curriculum. Education Management Information System, IMIS, has been completed and all schools uploaded upload to the system. The e-legislation agenda was advanced with the approval of the Electronic Filing and Electronic Transactions Act. Internet Exchange Point was established. A Secuda World software, software was introduced at the customs with the aim of reducing the time taken to clear goods and enhancing the process by which goods are cleared. While the Unified Land Information System was introduced to improve the, and streamline the land management processes. Substantial progress has been made on the introduction of the multi-purpose identification card. Madam Speaker, significant resources are being invested in development of the physical infrastructure. A preeminent requirement for the efficient movement of people, goods, and the delivery of services. This is particularly true of road infrastructure. The third edition of the Growth and Social Protection Strategy identified physical infrastructure as the building constraint to development, or the binding constraint to development. The response of government has been to invest heavily in the improvement of main roads, secondary roads, feeder roads, and community access roads. We aim at having 85% of the road network in good condition by the end of 2015 and 95% by the end of 2020. It is now possible to drive from Point Michel to Portsmouth and from Rosa to Melville Hall on modern, well-marked roads with pedestrian access. <laughs> Madam Speaker, in the last five years, we estimate that we have spent over $300 million on major roads. This includes projects such as Blue Bay to Grand Bay Road, Canefield to Poncasse, Lot 1, Rosa Valley Road, the, the rim, Poncasse to Melvin Hall, Lot 2, the Chinese Friendship Bridge constructed in Rosa, the West Coast Rehabilitation renamed Oliver Libla Highway, the Rosa Road Reinstatement Project, the link road across from the Windsor Park Stadium. We estimated that we spent about $50 million on road maintenance for the, for the period. This includes small projects executed in virtually all communities in the country. Other physical infrastructure started and or completed in the last five years include Granby Police Station, Marigot Police Station refurbished, Fire Station at Melbourne Airport, completed, the State House and State College, recreational facilities in several communities, health center rehabilitation in various communities, construction of resource centers in various communities. Madam Speaker, the housing revolution is a hallmark of this Labour Party administration. And through that program, housing has been provided to beneficiaries throughout the country. New houses were provided to citizens at Hillsborough Garden, Carib Territory, Chance, Bellevue Chopin, Bellevue Roll, and Granby, and several other communities and villages around Dominic. Steps to transform Silver Lake into a modern housing area have started with the completion of a six unit apartment building. In addition, six apartment buildings comprising 60 units are being built at Emsall and Buffer State and will be completed in the fiscal year 2014-2015. Between 2009 and 2013, more than 3,500 individuals 
benefited under the Housing Renovation and Sanitation Program. The program includes repairs to houses, construction of new houses, and the replacement of pit latrines with modern washrooms. 40 of the 50 Petro castles have been completed and handed to families in various communities. Land has been sold to beneficiaries at $1 per square foot under the Squatter Regularization Program. This has given many citizens ownership of land. More than 500 families in a number of communities have benefited from that component of the program. Madam Speaker, I, I stop it to point out that in Jubik, for all of the generations of residents there, there were squatters on private lands. An entire community comprising so many people were squatting on private lands. And when this Labour Party found out that was the case, we moved immediately to acquire the lands from the private owners and sold the land to Jubik at 25 cents a square foot. And to me personally, Madam Speaker, with all of the families that we have regular wise, that, is, that community is the closest to me in terms of what we have done through making people own a piece of Dominica that where they have worked for so many years. So, land has been sold in various new housing developments at prices below the prevailing market price with service to buyer estimates between 25% and 40%. So when we sell lands in Hillsborough Gardens, and we sell lands at Jimmy, and Canefield East, and Union Estate, which is popularly called Ian Pinard's development, all of these areas, the government has subsidized the, the price of land. Because when you factor in how much we spend to buy it, the infrastructure that we have spent, uh, monies we have spent to put infrastructure, if we were to sell a lot in Union Estate in Point Michel at the real market value, it would be as much as $10.25 per square foot. They are receiving it for, I believe, $7.25. The special mortgage facility at the 8th Bank and the Government Housing Loans Board facilitated many middle income families in constructing their own homes. The introduction of the Unified Land Information System is assisting in the conduct of land transactions and therefore is making it easier to have access to land for housing. There is no way in the Caribbean, Madam Speaker, where citizens enjoy or have enjoyed land, uh, housing loans at an interest rate of as low as 4% and 5%. And because of that policy by the government, there are many public officers and citizens of this country who now can boast of owning their own home because the government of Dominica, the Labour Party administration, has caused construction of homes through the reduction of interest rates to be affordable and attractive for citizens. So, Madam Speaker, we are within sight of a target of providing portable water to all the communities in Dominic. So far, we have completed and commissioned new and upgraded water supply systems for Warner, Campbell, Delis, Penville, Pitt Savan, Savan in Scottsdale, Grandfour, Concord, and North End in Marigot, Bacatel, Clifton, Cocoye, Vekas, and Shawford. In addition, the Wesley distribution system has been upgraded and a new 500,000 gallon storage tank was constructed at Monroe's. We undertook the West Coast water supply project to improve the quality and reliability of the water supply of the communities along the northwest coast from Capuchin to Culibistri and Salisbury, including Grand Savannah. Improvements were made in the water area one, WA1, that included increased storage capacity with the construction of new storage facilities in Springfield and Massac, 
establishment of a filtration plant at Springfield as a means of improving quality of water distributed to the population and replacing the distribution pipes on the West Coast. Distribution pipes were also replaced in Grand Bay. Works to upgrade the vents water supply is nearing completion and a contract has recently been signed to construct the Bell's Penrise water supply. <laughs> Madam Speaker, many countries in the region look on our social protection programs with interest and some have sought to replicate various aspects of it within their jurisdictions. The assessment of poverty in Dominica indicates that most of the poverty is as a result of low or no income. Hence, to grow out of poverty, employment opportunities have been foremost in our minds. The most direct solution for unemployment is the creation of jobs. We have taken on the International Labour Organization, ILO's recommendations for dealing with youth unemployment with the launch of the National Employment Program, NEP. The NEP has provided opportunities for young people and other unemployed persons to be exposed to the workplace and gain much needed mentorship and experience. Interns have been engaged in various positions in both the public and private sectors. The community employment component of the program has employed and empowered young farmers around the island, engaged community workers in cleaning, cleanup, and beautification campaigns, care of the elderly, and community tourism. When the program was launched in December 2013, we targeted the engagement of 400 people. To date, Madam Speaker, we have exceeded our target and more than 700 people have been engaged under the National Employment Program. And every one of them receives their salary sometimes even before the Prime Minister receives his salary. Because that's a commitment we have given to them that once they show up for work, they will be paid on time and in some cases before time. Some private sector firms have retained some NEP participants in permanent employment because of diligence and exemplary performance exhibited while on the NEP. So I want to commend the young men and women of our country. The NEP is well complemented by the apprenticeship program, which has trained over 200 young people in hospitality, stone cutting, construction, and landscaping. In addition, we have accomplished the following. Pioneered the Yes We Care program, which communities, which continues to be implemented. Lower the age for free medical care from 65 years to 60 years, and introduce free medical care for young people under the age of 18 years. Financial support is being provided to daycare centers in the hope that it will be less costly for low-income families and single mothers. Introduce programs such as the provision of free cooking gas in partnership with Petro Caribbean to assist the elderly, including our centenarians. Expansion of, of social security services. Implementing the BNTF program, which focused on critical community-based projects. Implementing the capacity enhancement and empowerment program designed to build capacity in communities where the level of poverty was above the national average and ensured that all those who should be beneficiaries of public assistance are being reached. Madam Speaker, why each citizen has a civic obligation to ensure the security of himself and his family? Government has the overarching responsibility to secure our national borders and to provide infrastructure, both physical and human, that allows our citizens to go about their business in a secure and peaceful environment. While we continue to collaborate with regional and international security agencies to stem the flow of illicit and illegal drugs and firearms, we have been working on strengthening our security apparatus, and so far, 
we have, Madam Speaker, obtained and commissioned a new dinghy to patrol the West Coast borders, increase coast patrols, and introduce the use of two very fast interceptor craft donated by the U.S. government. Increase the number of positions in the police force from 40, 444 to 500. Establish the Major Crimes Unit in 2012-2013. Improved crime fighting capacity through the use of 90 motorcycles donated to the police force by the People's Republic of China. Constructed the police station in Granby while construction is on the way at Kalibishi and Lapley. Established the police task force implemented the border management system, introduced the use of electronic recording of interviews. Madam Speaker, these are some of the things that we have done for the security of the country, and we continue to invest in the police force and government. But we must also call, Madam Speaker, for all of us to be responsible citizens. And we must never, by our utterances, give the world and our people the impression that Dominica is a dangerous place to live and to do business. Because, Madam Speaker, by our utterances, we may very well get people to fulfill those utterances. And we must continue to be responsible citizens in this country, irrespective of who you are or your station in life. Madam Speaker, our No Child Left Behind policy begins at the level of preschool and continues through to primary and secondary school, then on to the state college and university if necessary. Government has facilit facilitated registered preschools in delivering care to children of disadvantaged parents by making a grant of up to $2,500 available to these schools in proportion to the number of children in attendance. We have addressed the concern of parents who were challenged in meeting the transportation costs of children attending school by providing transportation to and from school. From fiscal year 2009-2010 to 2013-2014, $9.6 million was spent on transportation services for children to attend school in Dominica. <laughs> Of this, $7.7 .7 million was paid for contractual arrangements with private bus drivers for transporting students to school. Up the, seven, up, up the 76 bus drivers and the families benefit, benefited from this program. So $7.7 .7 million have been paid to bus drivers across Dominica. Money in the pockets, Madam Speaker, and job creation for them and for their families. To ease the cost of transfer from primary to secondary school, a school transfer grant of $500 is provided to students in need. This grant has been used to purchase uniforms, books, and shoes for students. It is now widely known that government supports students willing to attend the Dominica State College, but who do not have the financial means to do so by paying the cost of college attendance. The opening up of this opportunity to our students has seen the enrollment at the Dominica State College to the extent that currently 87% of students leaving secondary schools attend the DSC, Dominica State College, up to 7% in 2002. The 2011 population and housing census observed a 28.5% increase in the number of persons attaining GCE or CXE certificates over the past decade. I suspect one person was left out of that, of that <laughs> equation, Madam Speaker. <laughs> Additionally, the number of students attaining associate degrees rose expo exponentially by 972.5%, moving from 207 in 2000 and one to 2,220 in 2011. The number of people 
obtaining bachelor's degrees registered a 130.6% increase, moving from, moving from 842 in 2001 to 1,942 in 2011. The number of people attaining higher degrees, namely masters or doctoral level degrees, recorded a 61.7% increase. I cannot understand, Madam Speaker, how someone would have stayed home for all of his years and not tried to be part of his statistic. <laughs> But Madam Speaker, I can say that whether it is primary school I mentioned here, whether it is high school, college, or university, Roosevelt Scarrett Navy is the one in, it was among. <laughs> in addition, Madam Speaker, 1,550 teachers from the primary school level were trained, while 1,000 32 were trained at the secondary school level. Also, 33 teachers were trained under the Education Enhancement Project in specific technical and vocational subjects. 348 students have been granted scholarships to attend various universities and colleges around the world. In addition to those who were granted full scholarships, another 991 were given partial scholarships. In the fiscal year 2009-2010, government pledged and provided support to 36 teachers who were pursuing the early childhood program at the University of the West Indies and the Dominican State College. Not only have we given attention to the human resources, but we also invested in the physical infrastructure and have upgraded primary schools and secondary school plans throughout the island. On an annual basis, Rehabilitation works on school plans cost an average of $2 million. Additionally, seven secondary schools have been upgraded to meet technical and vocational education, TVET requirements. New schools have been constructed in Salibé, San Sauvé, and Portsmouth. Work has commenced on the Newtown Primary School, and designs are being finalized for the Thibault Primary School. Madam Speaker, in my address to the nation at the anniversary of our national independence last November, I reaffirmed the vision for the health sector. Our goal is to provide 21st century quality care to all Dominicans. I indicated then the equipment we intended to procure. I can report that, that except for an MRI and a surgical lower laparoscope, all have been purchased and are operational installed and functional. A new CT scan machine, a new mammogram machine, a new microscopy and colonoscopy system. And Madam Speaker, when you compare the, the cost of procuring the services in Dominica to that of Antigua or to that of New York or to that of Miami, this service here in Dominica is highly subsidized by the government of Dominica. <laughs> the down payment has been made towards the purchase of the surgical tower laparoscope. Negotiations are in progress with suppliers for the purchase of an MRI suitable for our requirements. Madam Speaker, government remains concerned about the escalating cost of health care. Government has been requested to provide significant assistance to individuals and families, and we have responded. We must find a sustainable solution to this challenge. We have been in discussion with some insurance companies, and more recently with Powell on the matter. We will continue to research the matter, and we are confident that we will find out, find or create a model that suits the particular circumstances of Dominica. Healthcare costs is prohibitive to so many families, too many families in our country. And I believe we need to find a solution that we can, where we can help these people fetch the health care they require. 
because I have seen too many women with breast cancer surgeries who do not have the resources to go out to Guyana or Barbados or the United States to get the post-surgery um, treatment that is critical to the recovery. But I must remind Madam Speaker, the entire population and the healthcare, and that healthcare is first and foremost a personal responsibility. This is the first step in addressing the healthcare issues. We have to watch what we eat and we need to exercise as much as possible to order, in order to prevent ourselves from getting sick. We have received the final drawings of the new hospital from the technical team of the People's Republic of China. The drawings are being reviewed and we expect to complete this process during the year. We thank the government of the PRC for this undertaking. We expect that the improved facilities will, Im will improve the quality of care to all citizens. And I can say to you, based on the drawings we have seen, this will be a state-of-the-art new, brand new hospital given to us as a gift by the PRC. Which all <laughs> Madam Speaker, we have more trained nurses at this time than we have ever had before. And I've been able to increase the number of nursing positions from 257 in 2009 to 371 in 2014. We have increased the number of doctors pursuing training in various specialized disciplines, including oncology and internal medicine. For the specialities that are not available locally, arrangements have been made to have visiting specialists. Services provided in that way are cardio, thoracic, cardiothoracic, and vascular surgery, and pediatric and adult cardiology. In addition, we can cite the following achievements. Expansion of the central medical stores, hyperbaric chamber internationally certified, diagnostic services were widely utilized, 1,500 uses of the CT scan were recorded, and 700 uses of the mammogram were recorded and four rapid testing sites for HIV AIDS are now available on island. Madam Speaker, the list of items I have highlighted is not exhaustive, but it's presented simply to make the point that we need to stop and take stock and be grateful for achievements. It, is also, it also points us to the realization work is not yet complete and that we must continue apace on the road to development. Madam Speaker, estimates of revenue and expenditures 2014-2015. Madam Speaker, I now present the budget proposals for 2014-2015 fiscal year. The Governor of Dominica intends to spend the sum of $552.4 million for the 2014 2015 fiscal year. This includes $378.5 million for recurrent expenditure, inclusive of debt servicing, interest, and amortization, and $173.8 million in respect of the Public Sector Investment Program, PSIP. Table 2 of the printed text shows the overall summary for the fiscal year 2014-2015 with comparative figures for the preceding year. The current, uh, current account surplus of $77.2 million is anticipated for 2014-2015. The estimated primary balance is 0.8% of GDP. Madam Speaker, the above mentioned expenditure will be financed from the following sources. Recurrent revenue of $417 million, local capital revenue in the amount of $5.1 million, grants in the amount of $80 million, of which 75 is capital grant and 5% is current grants, loans of $38.3 million. And I see the Senator taking notes so she could take back to say that the government's budget is fully financed here in the any shortfall in financing will be raised through the issuance of government instruments to include bonds and treasury bills. 
Madam Speaker, it is estimated that the recurrent revenues of $416.96 billion for 2014-2015 will surpass the 2013-2014 budget estimate by $15.5 million. The components of revenue are shown in Table 3 of the printed text. Madam Speaker, taxes on domestic goods and services constitute the largest source of recurrent revenue, totaling $181.6 million, or 44% of the total. Taxes on international trade and transactions contribute $63.3 million, or 15% um, of revenue. On tax revenues, particularly, the Economic Synergy Program will contribute a large to the budget. Government expects to generate resources of $80 million in that area. The sum of $34 million and $25.5 million respectively are expected to be generated from personal income tax and corporate income tax. Grants are expected mostly from the following sources. European Union under the banner accompanying measures, BAM, and the 10th EDF program of assistance. The People's Republic of China, the Government of Venezuela, the Climate Investment Fund, the Kingdom of Morocco, grant resources from India, Mexico, Suriname, Bahamas, and Guyana for rehabilitation in the aftermath of the 24th December 2013 trough. Recurrent expenditure, exclusive of debt amortization and interest payment is estimated at $316.6 million. This accounts for 57% of total expenditure and represents a 4% increase when compared to projected recurrent expenditure for fiscal year 2013-2014. The 2014-2014 recurrent expenditure budget, including debt amortization and interest payment, $378.5 million, compared with projected amount 2013-14 of $367.5 million. Table 4 of the printed text shows the, di the distribution of expenditure in the Ministry and Department. Madam Speaker, the allocation for the Ministry of Finance is the largest, that is $104.4 million, or 27.6%. This includes provision for interest payment and loan amortization of $61.9 million and for retiring benefits of $23 million. The Ministry of National Security will receive an allocation of $37.7 million or 10% while the Ministry of Public Works, Energy and Ports will receive the sum of $33.4 million or 8.8%. The allocation for the Ministry of Education and Human Resource Development is $62.9 million, or 16.6%. The sum of $47.7 million, or 12.6%, will go to the Ministry of Health, while the Ministry of Social Services will receive $17.6 million, or 4.7%. Madam Speaker, Table 5 of the printed text provides a summary of recurrent expenditure by economic classification. Madam Speaker, personal, personal emolument, which is, made, which is made up of salaries, wages, and allowances, accounts for $148.3 million, or 39.2% of the recurrent budget. Goods and services account for $93.5 million, or 24.7%. The provision for interest payments is $23.2 million, or 6.1% while debt amortization accounts for $38.7 million, or 10.2%. The sum estimated for transfers and subsidies is $48.8 million, or 12.9% of the budget. In respect to capital expenditure, the Public Sector Investment Program for the financial year 2014-2015 is estimated at $173.8 million, and financed as follows. Local funds of $60.5 million, grants of $75 million, 
loans of $38.3 million. Table 6 of the printed text provides a summary of the allocation of funds by ministries and departments. Madam Speaker, I will highlight a few of the projects included in the capital program for the year. The Ministry of Public Works will receive $57.5 million, which is 33.1% of the total public sector investment program, PSIP, for the continuation of infrastructural works and production of geothermal energy. The 24th December 2013 trough system resulted in significant damage to private property and public infrastructure. An allocation is made for the rehabilitation and construction works to drains in Newtown and Portney and Green Valley and Ciboli in Pont Michel, as well as, as, well as cleave stabilization and sea defense works at the Champagne Roadway down at Pont Michel. Madam Speaker, work will commence on the rehabilitation of the East Coast roads. This will commence with the Wadiab to Point Pilat Road with funding from the European Union. Designs and other preparatory works for the other East Coast roads and which form part of the project funded by the World Bank will also be undertaken during the year. In keeping with our promise to enhance the visibility and safety features of the road network, LED lights will also be installed along some portions of the Poncassi to Melville Road. This activity will continue until all the major roads on the island are fitted with LED lights. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I announced the Roseau Enhancement Project and the Portsmouth Enhancement Project as two major developments aimed at improving infrastructure and ambience in Roseau and Portsmouth. I will refer to these in greater detail later in this address, but in the current fiscal year, we see the commencement of the infrastructural works under phase one of these projects. In Roseau, the works will focus on road rehabilitation and drainage improvement, inclusive of sidewalks and street lighting. On the dim Eugene Charles Boulevard Bayfront and all streets in between, up to Hanover Street. The work should be undertaken in an incremental manner so as to minimize the inconvenience to the general public. Discussions are ongoing for the construction of an administrative office building in Portsmouth, and it is expected that the Dominica Social Security will finance the construction and will lease the space to the government. In addition, major rehabilitation works are being undertaken at Harbour Lane and Rodney Streets, and paving work will begin on the Lago to Purple Turtle section of the roadway. The Ministry of Lands, Housing, Settlements and Water Resource Management will continue in its effort to provide affordable housing to all segments of the society. An allocation of $31.9 million, or 18.4% of the capital budget, has been allocated towards this undertaking. The two main components of the work of the Ministry are the program to replace pit latrines with more modern washroom facilities and the construction of up to 1,500 new houses, which will begin this year. <laughs> Madam Speaker, the records of the Ministry of Housing indicate that close to 1,300 people have applied to purchase or obtain houses being constructed by the government. The 60 apartments being constructed at Emsel and Bath Estate is vastly inadequate to meet this demand. This points to a need that we, 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 we still have to satisfy, that is for every family to own a home. We anticipate that with this project, we anticipate that this project will take us closer to our goal. The houses will be constructed throughout the country, but with priority given to areas where the need is more acute. The Ministry of Employment, Trade, Industry and Diaspora Affairs will receive $21.8 million, or 12.5% of the capital budget. includes provision for the financing of some of the growth initiatives, such as the provision for the small business program, the apprenticeship program, the employment creation and mentorship program, and the promotion of exports. 
Madam Speaker, by all reports, the National Employment Program, NEP, has been successful in providing many young and not so young people with the opportunity of mentorship and training. We see the evidence of the work of the apprentices in the stone walls that have been rehabilitated on High Street and Turkey Lake. The budget allocation for operationalization of the park houses and the development of standards, which I mentioned earlier, as necessary to improving the export trade is made within the Ministry of Trade. The Ministry of Agriculture, Madam Speaker, has been allocated a capital budget of $11.5 million, or 6.7%, to continue implementation programs that will increase the output of agricultural commodities. Resources provided under the European Union EU-funded banner accompanying measures will be used to finance critical interventions in the agricultural sector. The program for the rehabilitation of feeder roads and farm access in the, in the major production areas will continue with grant funding from the bank. The Ministry of Agriculture will undertake a banana stabilization program to increase acreage of banana and plantains. 500 acres will be rehabilitated with tissue culture planting material. The livestock sub subsector is a critical subsector providing employment and contributes towards feeding households. The Ministry of Agriculture will introduce new genetic material at Central Livestock Farm to increase production of cattle, goat, sheep, rabbits, and pigs. This will be accompanied by training and installation of the required equipment. I see Minister Austria smiling. This project, this project will complement existing pork and poultry project and will improve food security, reduce the balance of trade and the export of foreign exchange, and thus increasing the circulation of money in the economy. Concurrently, work will continue to complete the abattoir. One of the main challenges for livestock farmers is the cost of feed. We are in discussions with a French firm that is willing to establish an animal feed plant in Dominica. In addition, the company is also engaged in supplying chicks and is willing to provide that service to Dominican farmers. Government will continue to provide support to horticulture, as it will do for coffee and cocoa. These projects are important components of the diversification program. Under these projects, assistance will be provided to farmers to increase production in the selected crops. I trust that farmers will make good use of this assistance. I will refer specifically to cocoa and coffee later in this address. Madam Speaker, the Ministry of Environment, Natural Resources and Physical Planning will receive $10.9 million or 6.4% of the total capital allocation. The major project to be implemented is the Disaster Vulnerability Reduction Project, DVRP. This project is aimed at reducing vulnerability to natural hazards and climate change impacts in Dominica. The project compri comprises of four components, prevention and adaptation investments. This component is designed to reduce physical vulnerability and pilot adaptive measures to build resilience to current and future hydrometeorological shocks. Activities will include the construction of infrastructure for water storage and distribution, transportation and improvement of drainage in selected areas. It is expected that the first undertaken to this component is the rehabilitation of storm drains and increasing water storage to complete the work done under the West Coast Water Supply Project. Also, Madam Speaker, the designs for the Poncasse to Castle Bruce Road will be undertaken this year as part of this project. The subsequent construction works will also form part of this project. Another component, Madam Speaker, is capacity building and data development, hazard risk management and evaluation. This component will support capacity building for analysis and assessment of risk from natural hazards and climate change. Natural disaster response investment is a third component. 
This will assist in designing a mechanism for the government to respond to emergencies if they arise during the implementation of the project. Project management and implementation support, or the fourth component, is for providing project management support. Later in the proceedings, Madam Speaker, I will present a resolution to the Parliament seeking the approval for the financing arrangements for this project. The Ministry of the Environment will also receive an allocation which will be used to assist fisher folk to procure equipment and supplies and to provide further training in fishing techniques which will result in increasing the catch of fish. The Ministry of Education and Human Resource Development will receive $7.2 million or 4.1% of the total capital allocation to continue to improve education infrastructure and the quality of education services. Specifically, the allocation will finance the works at the Newton Primary School and the continuation of the Education Enhancement Project. With an allocation of $7 million or 4% the Ministry of Health will focus on improvement works at the Portsmouth and Marigold hospitals and on renovation of other health facilities. The move towards upgrading of equipment will continue. Importantly, Madam Speaker, in this fiscal year, the Ministry will begin the construction of the new State of the Hospital to provide high quality medical services to the population. The Ministry of Tourism and Legal Affairs will receive $5 million or 2.9% of the PSIP budget. After several phases of discussions, I am happy to report that we have resolved all the outstanding technical matters and we are in a position to start the actual construction of the Rosal River Promenade. In preparation, a written constructed on the northern link bank of the river. The effort to improve air access will continue, likewise upgrades to facilities at rates. Madam Speaker, an amount of $1.6 million has been earmarked for the Ministry of Culture, Youth and Sports. This includes an allocation for the construction of an indoor sporting facility in Stockfar and the Roseau Recreational Facility. Also, work is expected to be undertaken on the Sufair playing field and additional works at the Woodford Hill playing field and the Tetmon basketball hard court. These facilities will ensure that youthful energies are utilized in a positive way and provide opportunities for the residents to improve their physical well-being. Funds are also being provided to ensure that the Windsor Park Sports Stadium is maintained at acceptable standards to host sporting and cultural events which generate income for the country. The full list of the projects is contained in the ex estimates of expenditure. All of these projects are especially chosen because of the potential to bring social and economic development to our people. I take the opportunity once again to appeal to the good conscience of our employees, our contractors, our consultants, and everyone involved in project execution and implementation to strive for a greater degree of efficiency in the implementation of the capital program. To do otherwise is to shortchange a country and is tantamount to wastage of scarce resources. I trust that I will get the support of all in this regard. Madam Speaker, it is patently obvious that if we want to continue providing the social goods and services for our people, enable them to purchase the goods and services they want, and strengthen the social safety net to protect them from unforeseen misfortune, then we must diversify and grow our economy. We cannot provide these facilities unless we generate the wealth to pay for them. In the emerging highly competitive marketplace, we all must become more enterprising. We can no longer sit back and expect government or overseas investors to do what is necessary. We need to work together because we are all stakeholders in the creation of a better Dominica of which we all dream. Dominica has much to offer in terms of material resources, but above all, it has talented, resourceful, and resilient citizens 
as well as a caring and responsible government. Let us therefore commit ourselves to intensifying our efforts to take Dominica forward towards the vision of a prosperous and just society. Let me assure you that this government will take a leadership role in responding positively to the challenge of meeting our growth targets by making investments aimed at increasing our foreign exchange and export earnings, while simultaneously improving the environment for doing business in Dominica. The strategic growth interventions we have in mind are not all new, but in fiscal year 2014-2015, we'll begin to implement new phases of these interventions, and I will refer to 10 such items. Agriculture will continue to be prominent in the mix of activities contributing to economic growth in Dominica. However, the processes involved in producing and exporting agricultural commodities now require adherence to a regime of environmental and quality protocols that can be quite challenging. However, we have been preparing for this. In order to meet the handling, labeling, and packaging standards, that are required. Government has constructed two pack houses at substantial cost, one in Portsmouth and the other in Roseau, and is in the process of equipping both. Commodities processed through the pack houses will bear the official stamp of the Bureau of Standards, indicating that the packaged items would have met the standards required for export. The requirement of personnel for the pack houses has commenced the recruitment, sorry, of personnel for the pack houses has commenced, financing of equipment has been obtained, and a training program for recruiting staff is being finalized. A regime of standards and the accompanying tests to ensure compliance is also applicable to manufactured products intended for export or domestic consumption. The National Center for Testing Excellence has been built at Stock Farm and is being equipped to discharge this function. As in, as in the case of the pack houses, training for recruited staff in the procedures and use of installed equipment is in train. The funding for these activities have been obtained from the CARICOM Development Fund. In addition to this, adequate transportation is required to address issues relating to the marketing and sale of local products. There are only short distances between our islands. OECS and CARICOM countries cannot realize the true potential without improving their maritime transport facilities. We need vessels to transport people and goods cheaply between the islands. Our Caribbean Sea should be a bridge and not an obstacle. Dominica intends to fill this vacuum. Some progress has been made in determining the kind of vessel that should be purchased. Government will continue this dialogue, and we expect that by the time a final decision is made, the volumes of agricultural produce would have increased, thereby improving the viability of this investment. Madam Speaker, the need for agricultural credit at a rate that is affordable and under conditions that are appropriate for growing a crop or engaging in livestock farming is persistent. This need persists Notwithstanding that farming incomes are not taxed, vehicles are available to farmers free of duty, fertilizer is subsidized by government, and farmers receive planting material free or at a substantially discounted prices. In addition, technical services are provided through the Division of Agriculture at no cost. Over the years, government has responded to this need through various mechanisms. We established a credit facility operated through the aid bank and interested credit unions. Under this facility, farmers were able to contract loans of up to $50,000, where 50% 50 of the loan amount was given as a grant. Evaluation of the program revealed that it was highly instrumental in allowing farmers to diversify and to provide support to those who were experiencing difficulties in dealing with fluctuating banana prices and other demanding new product and marketing conditions. One of the issues that the Agricultural Investment Unit has had to contend with 
relates to farmers who have not been consistent in meeting the obligations to the unit. As a result, the quantum of funds that should have been revolving as grants and loans to farmers have not kept pace with the demand. To correct the situation, the AIU will be reorganized so it is responsive to the needs of commercial farmers, whose output can have a positive impact on exports and, and on food security. Where necessary, business management courses will be designed for farmers to instill in them the notion of farming as a business with great potential. In the budget, of, in the budget for last fiscal year, Madam Speaker, I made reference to coffee as one of the crops for growing our agricultural sector. Today, I am pleased to report that a coffee processing plant constructed at one mile in Portsmouth and financed by the government of Venezuela will soon be commissioned. The plant has been installed, capacity has an installed capacity to process 2,000 tons of coffee per year. I must thank the Venezuelan Army Corps of Engineers for what I consider to have been an exceptional job on the construction of the facility. As of this date, Madam Speaker, 200 farmers have indicated interest in producing far coffee to supply to the plant, and the Division of Agriculture has provided 10,000 plants of coffee to farmers free of cost. Madam Speaker, the number of plants is equivalent to about 100 acres on the culti coffee cultivation. These acreages have been established throughout the country, with the largest number of plants being cultivated in the Northeast region. There has been an increasing demand for cocoa, both on the local market and for export. Government will therefore continue to support rehabilitation and expansion of cocoa. Progress is satisfactory for reaching the target of 300 new acres of the crop, with 50 acres having been established, while 100 acres have been rehabilitated. Let me take this opportunity to thank all Dominicans, particularly those in the farming sector, for embracing our Haitian residents and for having them work with us to sustain and grow the agricultural sector as a major plan of our economy. Government's commitment to take every measure possible to develop the tourism industry remains as, as strong as ever. We are consist, cognizant of the fact that tourism has strong link, linkages with other sectors of the economy, especially agriculture, which supplies a variety of products to the hotels and restaurants locally. One concern of the industry to which government is giving close attention is that of increasing the number of market-ready rooms. As a contribution to overcoming this, government is proceeding to complete the construction of the Cabrits Hotel and Spa, which is being financed largely by the government of Morocco. Direct assistance has also been provided to the Atlantic Hotel in Anzdemi, and we have partnered with the proprietor of Vistas of Iwasi to complete the construction of a Frista Hotel in Crippish River in the Carib Territory. These interventions will increase the number of market-ready rooms. Madam Speaker, I will refer to the Citizenship by Investment, CBI program, shortly. But it is necessary to indicate that under the relaunched program, a real estate component has been included. And among other things, it targets investments in tourism infrastructure. Under the program, a memorandum of understanding was signed with Range International for the construction of a hotel in the vicinity of the Cabrits. The, discussion, the discussions on this project are ongoing and it is expected that an additional 125 rooms of five-star quality will be added to the stock of rooms. The signing of the final agreement is imminent. Discussions are also continuing with a private firm which is, in, which is interested in constructing a hotel on the site currently used by the Public Works Corporation. That hotel will result in an increase in rooms, but importantly, it will increase the number of export-ready rooms in the Roseau area. Just a few weeks ago, Madam Speaker, 
we had the opportunity to host a test match. And I'm advised that we could not accept the offer because we did not have rooms available in Dominica. These are the opportunities that we wish to take advantage of because without the le relevant infrastructure, we will miss more of these and the economic benefits that can be derived from them. Improvements to the Melbourne Airport to accommodate night landing has had a positive impact on arrivals. However, for some originating countries, notably in Latin America, the issue of same-day arrival is of concern. This concern is easily addressed if attention is paid to those inter-island carriers that have inter-connection agreements with airlines operating out of Latin America. Let me also add that the provision of decent passenger ferries would mean that visitors would start their vacation as soon as they board the vessel for the last leg of the journey to Dominica. Product development is necessary to keep abreast with the requirements of visitors. The White Kubali National Trail stands out as one of the most promising products and it is becoming a premier attraction to trail lovers. A great number of visitors come to Dominica for the purpose of walking various segments of the trail. This has contributed to the development of a number of restaurants and small bed and breakfast type enterprises in various communities along the trail. Government will encourage support for these and similar enterprises through its many business support interventions, notably that established with the National Development Foundation, where $5 million has been made available by government for on lending to small and medium enterprises. We encourage communities along the trail to, take, to make use of these opportunities. The Rosso Riverside Promenade is another important addition to the tourism product. After protracted discussions with the various stakeholders, work will commence on the construction of Rosso Riverside Promenade. In the first phase of the project, river defenses will be constructed to provide protection against storm surges on the north, northern bank of the river. This phase has been estimated to cost approximately $3.8 million. Dominica Madam Speaker, is in a prime position to capitalize on producing unique tourism products based on culture and heritage, environmental preservation and appreciation, as well as health, education, and sports tourism. Madam Speaker, we propose to develop further our efforts in education tourism. The presence of medical students on island is a boost to the economy, particularly in the areas where they are situated. We have entered into new arrangements with the Ross University aimed at increasing the number of students. In order to accommodate the proposed increased number of students and faculty, Ross University is now improving its infrastructure. The immediate boost to the construction sector is welcome, and the impact of having more students on island for a longer period will undoubtedly add to economic activity, particularly in the north of the island. The proposed improvements to the main hospital will help cement the relationship with the medical school. An improved hospital places us in a better position to provide a full range of services required by the medical schools. Madam Speaker, every student and staff member of the medical school is a guest in our country. As such, we consider them to be part of the tourism sector. We will do what is necessary to ensure that this part of the tourism sector continues to grow. Madam Speaker, government has had a fiscal incentive regime in place for over 40 years. The regime was intended to encourage investors, individuals and companies to establish businesses and to expand existing ones. An objective assessment of the effectiveness of the existing regime leads to the inescapable conclusion that it may no longer be relevant to current business models of investments. Several concerns have been raised by existing and potential investors concerning the competitiveness of the current fiscal incentives. These have included, for example, issues concerning transfer fees applicable to land transactions, 
stamp duties, the efficacy of the VAT for, deal for dealing with certain investments, such as the sale of villas, timeshare arrangements, and fractional ownership of property. Other issues include withholding tax on rental income and the need for the alien landholding license and the associated fees. Government will appoint a working group to review the various, various fiscal incentives regime offered to the private sector. The review will, among other things, determine the relevance of the existing tax concessions and the application of these concessions to new and emerging forms of investment models. As this review progresses, discussions will be held with stakeholders in the private sector. The results of this exercise will help determine the need for amendments to existing legislation, fiscal incentives, regime, and to the fees and other charges the investor has to meet in doing business in Dominica. And that is a matter which this government is totally committed to. Government has welcomed the formation of the Dominica Business Forum, an advocacy group representative of the entire private sector. Government would like to see this body as a true partner in identifying and dialoguing on matters of development and economic growth. We want to reach that stage where government only has to focus on creating and improving the environment for private enterprise to flourish so that they become the main drivers of economic growth. To this end, a committee of senior government officials has been appointed to serve as the body which will engage the private sector in this partnership. In the first instance, the issues of concern to the forum will determine the agenda for these meetings. It is intended that the engagement will be done on a regular basis and over time the agenda will be broadened to address issues of mutual concern. The focal point for the forum is a secretary to the cabinet who will be the first point of contact for the forum. In order that our enterprises address the challenge of achieving economies of scale due to si the size, it is important that they begin to look outward to create networks and business models that capitalize on the benefits of the OECS Economic Union and the wider CARICOM. In this regard, the OECS Business Council is the ideal starting point. This council has been established as the major advocate of the private sector in the OECS. Its principal focus is to place the sector on a more competitive footing, to capitalize on opportunities for investment and trade, and to make policy proposals to governments to achieve these objectives. Government endorses the OECS Business Council and encourages the private sector to embrace it as another instrument of advocacy at the regional level. The Synergy by Investment program has been designed to give a boost to foreign direct investment. The program seeks to increase foreign direct investment and mobilize investments for development projects, particularly investments in tourism infrastructure. The CBI is a program that is attracting the attention of virtually all governments in the region. A unit has been established within the Ministry of Finance to deal exclusively with all aspects of the CBI, including the review of applications, initiating the due diligence on, applic on applicants, preparing promotional material, and responding to queries on the program. Further, we have entered into an arrangement with a British-based firm, CS Global, to undertake the marketing of the program. Among other things, the firm will, will be responsible for ensuring that Dominica's program becomes well known around the world and that it is adequately represented at international fora. Even as we speak, as we seek to give greater coverage of the program, the integrity and quality will always be preserved. Madam Speaker, much interest has been shown by prospective investors and we have received expression of interest in regard to the financing activities in mining, ongoing hotel projects, and the creation of executive office space. The program is intended to increase FDIs, which means it will be targeted at new projects. Also, any projects approved must create an asset in Dominica. The government has also produced a list of projects which will make available, which will make available to interested investors should they wish to pursue these investments under the program. Here to the board, 
dis the discussions we are having with Range International. We are also confident that the CBI approach will also open the way for moving forward with financing for other tourism-related projects, such as the development of the Woodford Hill Resort, which, because of the global crisis, has been, has been challenged in attracting equity financing needed to move the project forward. The CBI program is also geared at attracting financing for public sector projects. Funds obtained under the cash option of the projects are used to provide counterpart financing for major development projects, such as the geothermal project and the large road infrastructure projects. These interventions are expected to be converted to jobs in the economy. Madam Speaker, our ongoing negotiations with a French consortium to develop the geothermal energy potential of the Rosa Valley has reached the point where we could sign an agreement by October 2014. The encouraging results obtained from the drilling of the first production well have advanced the delivery of cheaper, cleaner, and more reliable energy to Dominicans. Discussions, discussion has commenced with Dominic on improvements to be made to the grid for accepting this new source of energy for transmission and distribution to consumers. Dominica has been highlighted as a leader in geothermal development. As we take steps to convert this energy into lower electricity costs, we must identify the investment which would, which would like to target. That is, we must position ourselves to develop industries that will be successful as a result of this cheaper electricity. For young people, there are new career prospects that become available, and now is the time to prepare ourselves to derive these benefits. The domestic plant, as I said earlier, is expected to come on stream by 2016. Madam Speaker, the rehabilitation and enhancement of the city of Roseau and the town of Portsmouth have been on government's agenda for some time. These interventions for improving Roseau and Portsmouth are two components of a comprehensive program of strategic measures designed not only to enhance the appearance of these main centers of commerce and economic activity, but also to upgrade and expand the infrastructure in order to attract new investment. This initiative will build on earlier interventions, such as the Rosa Road Improvement Project, which included the construction of the Center Roma Back Road, the Link Road, and the construction of the Bath Road Bridge. The latter, along with the Hanover Street Bridge, has enhanced the flow of traffic and entry into, the, into an exit from the city. The first phase of the Roseau Enhancement Project includes rehabilitation of all the streets to include subsurface drainage, road pavement structure, sidewalk, utility dock, banks, and street lights. The components also include the following. One, the design of sites for permanent parking facilities and a new bus station on the periphery of Rosa. Two, construction of a new bridge to replace the West Bridge. Three, provision for improved traffic flow at Pottersville. Four, construction of a bypass for the Botanic Gardens. And five, construction of, of a cruise ship and ferry terminal. During the fiscal 2014-2015, work will commence on the road aspect of the project, focusing on roads in the vicinity of the David Eugenia, Eugenia Charles Boulevard. Madam Speaker, the town of Portsmouth will also receive attention to improve its appearance, beautify public spaces, and increase access and exit. Among the improvements targeted for Portsmouth are, one, rehabilitation of the streets within the town, two, the construction of a new link road from Glanville to One Mile. Three, a bypass from Purple Turtle to the Cabrets. Four, the construction of a new bus station. And five, the erection of, of a new administrative building to house government and other offices. Other projects that are planned under the pro this program are a state-of-the-art indoor sporting facility to be located at Stockford, a petroleum transiting facility and the setting up of the infrastructure for the bulk export of water in Portland. Madam Speaker, 
the enhancement of Rosa and Portsmouth must go beyond the interventions I have highlighted. The value of the planned investments will be diluted if we do not pay greater attention to cleanliness by avoiding littering on the streets, sidewalks, and gutters. In that same vein, the owners of vehicles with sound systems are reminded to keep the volumes and levels that are not deemed a public health nuisance. Madam Speaker, an often overlooked catalyst for national development is our youth. Young people, by virtue of their numbers, their energy, their better education, their idealism, and the desire to prove their independence, are definitely one of the most valuable resources at our disposal. History shows that young people have always played a vital role in making the transition from one era to the, to the next. The previous 60-year era that won us independence and managed the process that took us to the first decades of the 21st century was essentially propelled by young people. The current era that is driven by the new technology belongs to our youth. Government will continue to work closely with the youth division, the Dominican National Youth Council, the Dominican State College, the National Employment Program, the National Development Foundation, the Small Business Development Unit, the private sector, and all other stakeholders in the wholesome development of our young men and women to empower them to take their rightful place in leading the movement for economic emancipation in our country. You can therefore expect to see a major reform of the secondary and tertiary curricula, both formal and informal, to meet the needs of our children with a range of academic and non-academic intelligences which are essential to the development of our nation. Going forward, we are looking to the Dominican State College, the Youth Division, the NYP, the NEP, and all the agencies that serve the youth to help induct more of their interns into the entrepreneurial culture with a clear understanding that even though all will not want to be entrepreneurs, research has shown that an enterprising employee is an asset to his or her employer. Madam Speaker, with cheaper geothermal energy imminent, a modern infrastructure for the export of agricultural commodities, a robust tourism sector, adequate financing of development projects, better education and training, and a friendly legal and regulatory environment, we can expect sustained expansion of the economy of Dominica. Fiscal measures. Madam Speaker, this government is mindful of the economic challenges which confront the population as a result of the impact of the global economic climate. Government is also aware of the impact on government finances and the imperative for introducing measures that will facilitate economic growth. The challenge for government is how best to maintain strong macroeconomic policies and prudent fiscal management, while at the same time attempting to meet the needs of its citizens, and especially to devise realistic responses to the needs of the private sector, who we see as our partners in development. In that regard, we have considered a number of recommendations made by several groups and obtained through discussions and through submissions made during the last fiscal year. For the record, Madam Speaker, I wish to confirm that we engage groups and individuals during the year and we take note of the recommendations that are made either in writing or through various forums. What is important to us is that we listen to the population whenever and wherever they speak and respond in the best way possible. The proposals we have received, we have received range from requests for reduction and re removal of the VAT, reduction and removal of income taxes, reduction and re removal of import duties on certain products, reduction and re removal of excise taxes, increasing salaries for public officers, relief to pensioners and people of pensionable age who do not have a pension, and provision of health financing. 
amidst our review of this request, we have to remain focused on the fact that as government, we are required to provide goods and services to the citizens. There is always the risk that when there is a reduction in taxes, that it has to be accompanied by increase other, in other taxes or a reduction in expenditure. A reduction in expenditure could mean the withdrawal of some services provided by government. Further, proposals to reduce taxes, which could have the effect of minimizing the impact of development policies, are also not appropriate. For example, we consider the complete removal of duties on juice to be at variance with the policy to invest in agriculture and to encourage citizens to eat and use what we grow. It is a view of government that a tax structure should always be relevant to the needs of the country. As such, we have initiated a process whereby we propose to undertake a review of the tax system, beginning with another review of the income tax regime. The Caribbean Technical Assistance Center, CATA, has indicated a willingness to assist in this process. It is likely that the entire system may be changed. For example, we could opt to set a flat rate of income tax, which may make administration and calculation simpler. We will engage the relevant stakeholders in this exercise. Madam Speaker, I will not outline the fiscal measures adopted for this fiscal year. The intention is to bring relief to the extent that we can to our citizens and residents as we work towards expansion of the economy. Measures aimed at improving the efficiency of clearing courier packages. Madam Speaker, the advent of online and internet shopping and the growing awareness by the population that goods and services required urgently can be accessed quickly via the internet have resulted in a new type of trade and growth of the courier business. The increase in that type of business now necessitates a change in the procedures utilized in clearing such items. Generally, people who utilize courier services anticipate receiving the goods within a short period of time. Customs and port procedures must take this fact into consideration. The current practices by which courier packages are cleared have not kept pace with the growth of that type of activity. A number of administrative and legis legislative changes have been identified to address this matter. Of specific significance is the introduction of a de minimis, de minimis system. Under such a system, goods imported below a certain value do not attract any taxes and fees, and the clearance procedures, including data requirements, are minimized. The new system, which will be established in for the immediate release of goods valued up to CIF EC $150. This is in keeping with the already established procedure of processing gift packages. During the sorting process, goods valued at CIF EC $150 and less will be released to the courier agents instead of being retained by customs for duty purposes. <laughs> The de minimis system shall not apply to commercial goods, tobacco products, or alcoholic beverages. Commercial goods are goods imported in Dominica for any commercial, industrial, occupational, institutional, or other similar purpose. We therefore expect the cooperation of all so that no one will, be, will attempt to misuse the system for commercial purposes or to import tobacco or alcoholic beverages. In addition to the introduction of this system, the Customs Division and the Dominica ANC Ports Authority will introduce new administrative procedures which will facilitate ease of processing for those persons who must go to the port to clear goods. It is anticipated that this change will facilitate businesses as well as individuals in clearing goods in a more efficient manner. The estimated revenue program is $435,000 $664.47. The new de minimis system is to be introduced 
from August 1, 2014. Madam Speaker, I referred to the Synergy by Investment Program earlier. Cabinet approved approval has granted for residence tourism policy. Among other things, the policy specifies the concessions and waivers granted under the program and conditions under which such concessions and waivers are granted. The real estate option of the Synergy by Investment CBI program allows for investments in real estate subject to meeting the requirements of the CBI program. Consideration has been given to participants in the Residential Tourism Initiative to be el eligible for Dominican citizenship under the CBI program. The Residential Tourism Policy is now to be implemented as a component under the CBI program. This gives the local private sector the opportunity to make use of the benefits that are available. Madam Speaker, during the preparatory stage and in the early days of implementation of the value added tax, among the recommendations made and accepted was the application of a lower rate of VAT on hotel accommodation activities. As such, only a VAT rate of 10% is applied to rooms and a dive services, while a general rate of 15% is applied to all other services, including food and beverage. I have always indicated, Madam Speaker, that the VAT is the backbone of the revenue. The VAT replaced a range of taxes, including the consumption tax, the sales tax, and entertainment tax. The tax base was broadened and the rate set lower than the average rate of taxes which were removed. When it was introduced, we promised the nation that if the VAT performed well, we would reduce the rates of personal income tax. This we have done and continue to do. To the large scale reduction which has been requested would not only be dangerous, but would be responsible on the part of government. Therefore, Madam Speaker, we have reviewed the proposal that has been made by the sector and have decided to remove the VAT on service charge which is charged by the hotels. A service charge is commonly added to the services offered by a hotel. The service charge is not a government tax or fee. It is the view of the tourism sector that the application of the VAT to the service charge makes Dominica less competitive. Effective 1st September 2014, the VAT will not apply to the service charge. We hope, we hope that this measure will have the desired effect of making Dominica a more competitive destination. Madam Speaker, we are conscious of the changing of dynamics in caring for children and their loving. There are two products that are more widely used than before. One is baby wipes and the other is disposable diapers. Baby wipes are now classified in the same category as soaps. In an effort to protect the local production of soap, the tariff on all items in this category is as high as 65%. Baby wipes, however, are not manufactured in Dominica and thus cannot be considered as an actual threat to the soap manufacturers. We have decided to remove the import duty on the baby wipes and to set the rate at zero. In that regard, to, in, in regard to disposable diapers, the import duty rate is 20%. In a previous budget, this government reduced the rate for baby disposable diapers to zero. There is no threat to local production as the item is not produced locally. We have decided to remove the import duty on adult disposable diapers and set the rate as at zero also. <laughs> the Madam Speaker, I know of several families who care for their parents and grandparents, and they always complain to us that disposable diapers are prohibited, the cost is prohibited, and I'm sure this will help them in a tremendous manner. <laughs> These changes are expected to take effect on 1st August 2040. <clears throat> Government is seeking to have citizens make greater use 
of Information and Communication Technologies and has done so through a number of policies. Included in these are the construction and outfitting of resource centers in many communities, making computers available at schools, the introduction of new e-government services, including e-filing, and the passage of the relevant e-government legislation. The government has provided full access to the internet via wireless network at the Dominica State College. We believe that making computers more accessible to households will complement the ongoing efforts. Equally important is the necessity of assisting small businesses to incorporate the use of technology in their operations. Consequently, Madam Speaker, government has decided to remove import duty of 5% and the custom service charge of 3%, which are now applied to computers. It remains that only the VAT and the environmental levy will be applied to computers on importation. We expect that this measure will benefit the many young people who rely on the technology for research and educational activities, as well as those who have set up small businesses with the assistance and guidance of the Small Business Unit and the National Development Foundation of Dominica, NDFD. This measure will come into effect from 1st August 2014. <laughs> Madam Speaker, there is one category of Dominican residents to which I, I would like at this time to turn my attention. There are persons in this society who have worked tirelessly at building the family structure. They have not been the most trained or skilled of the time. But by dint of hard work and perspiration, they did all that was necessary to put food on the table of their families and a roof over their heads. I am speaking about persons of pensionable age who did not work long enough in any particular job to qualify for pension, either state or private, but who nevertheless are builders of Dominica. I speak here of retired gardeners, yes. tradesmen, fishermen, housewives, community workers, domestics, to name just a few categories. Some of them have no offspring, and in other instances, the children of these individuals are not in a financial position yeah. or generally not minded to assist as they should. Irrespective of the circumstances, the reality is that there is a category of senior citizens in Dominica who helped in their own way to build this country and who the country should now assist, yeah. however small, in enabling them to lead a dignified lives. A long-term solution to this scenario must be found. And I'll be asking actuaries associated with the Social Security Scheme to advance options for consideration in the medium to long term. Far more urgent, however, is the need for the state to assist these persons through the current economic squeeze that besets our country. I propose, therefore, that effective 1st October 2014, all persons 70 years and older with no own source of income or whose income is less than $200 a month shall be entitled to a cost of living grant of $200 a month from the government of Dominica. This initiative shall continue until such time as a modern system can be effective for the benefit of those who have contributed over the years to the development of our country. Yes. Yes. People wishing to benefit from this measure are asked to register with the village council offices or the constituency offices where they live. The information will be assessed by the government. Yes. In the case of other senior citizens, who currently receive pensions as a result of their contributions over the years. The government recognizes that these people would be among the most vulnerable in an environment of continuously rising prices due to the factors beyond the control of the government or indeed the retail sector of Dominica. Such persons who currently receive between $200 and $600 a month 
shall receive effective 1st October 2040. What I consider like in this cyber age to refer as to refer to as a $25 a month top up from the government. So anybody who receives 200 between 200 and 600 dollars pension will get a monthly top up of $25 a month. I appeal to all those receiving more than $600 a, a month to hold the strain a little longer, as the government would hope to be in a position to also adjust the pensions of this category in an upward direction in the near future. Madam Speaker, in fiscal year 2013 2014, that's, that's, that, that's the real budget. <laughs> government launched the National Employment Program, NEP, aimed at providing unemployed people with the opportunity for mentorship and apprenticeship. After the first six months, an assessment was undertaken of those who were given jobs, job placements under the NEP and the assessments have been very positive for the majority. We have are, we are advised also that the businesses where these interns are placed have also benefited from the additional human resource capacity which is provided. The program will continue in fiscal year 2014-2015, but government wishes to support those businesses which are willing to convert these interns and apprentices into full-time employees and have them engage in unsustainable employment. In that regard, government proposes to offer a rebate to businesses who engage new employees during the period 1st August 2014 to 31st July 2015 in the first instance. For business to qualify for rebate, the new hires must be engaged in new jobs, not, re not replacement, acting, or temporary jobs. The rebate will be equivalent to 2% of the gross salary paid to a new employee. The minimum rebate per hire per 12-month period is set at $600. The maximum rebate per employer is set at $6,000 per 12-month period. The benefit will be applied to the filing for the corresponding tax year. For example, a company providing new permanent jobs in that period, August to December 2014, will be able to make use of this benefit when it files taxes for 2014, once the criteria is met. Companies will have to inform the Inland Revenue Division when new people are hired. The corporate income tax rebate will be given to all companies who are up to date with their filing and in good standing with the Inland Revenue Division. It will not apply to businesses with tax holidays as no tax is due from businesses with tax holidays. A company with no chargeable income would have no tax payable and so no rebate is possible. A new company which has been granted fiscal incentives on the condition that the employer given number of people would not qualify under this proposal unless they employ more people than the incentives license would have covered. The rebate will be computed on the tax payable after deducting any exemptions. For example, if the tax due for corporate income tax is $5,000 and a business has a rebate of value at $1,000, that business will be required to pay only $4,000. Since this initiative is new, we propose to discuss it further with the private sector so that the sector can avail itself of the benefits. This measure will be reviewed before July 2015 to determine if the desired outcomes are achieved. Madam Speaker, when we speak of sustainable jobs, we speak about real opportunities, not pie-in-the-sky promises, but real and tangible opportunities. <laughs> that will benefit both the newly employed as well as the private sector. Madam Speaker, among the requests of the private sector, is a reduction in the rate of corporate tax. Corporate tax is set at 
and is charged on profits. Government has considered this request within the context that companies have indicated interest in reinvesting profits back into these businesses. Government is supportive of the efforts in increasing economic activity in the, in the country and therefore has considered the request for reducing the rates of corporate income tax, which companies have indicated will be plugged back into investment. To that end, government has decided to reduce the rate of corporate income tax from 30% to 25% over a two-year period. In the first year, the adjustment will be 2%, with a, with a 3% being applied in the subsequent year. This measure will come into effect for income year 2015. <laughs> the estimated revenue loss for the full imp implementation of this policy is $3.6 million. Madam Speaker, our policy to improve the housing stock in Dominica is well known. Generally, the policy has been implemented in a way that the beneficiary receives the benefit directly. For example, we provided loans at interest rates lower than the going, rate, going market rate to certain categories of low to middle income earners and caused the effective mortgage rates to drop. We sold land to squatters at $1 per square foot and reduced the price per square foot to an, to an amount below the market value in other developments. We provided direct assistance to disadvantaged people who would not otherwise be able to repair the homes. We have heard the request for removal of import duty on building materials, but our experience is that that benefit does not always reach the intended recipients. In fact, in fact, very often, it is only when the beneficiary does the importation himself that he gets the full benefit. Therefore, Madam Speaker, as another component of the housing revolution, we propose to increase the mortgage interest allowance from $15,000 to $25,000 per annum. <laughs> By our estimate, this policy will directly impact a significant number of people who currently pay mortgage interest in excess of $15,000 per year. Importantly, we hope that, this, that it will serve as an encouragement for people to con construct houses as well as to be in a position to do repairs and other works that would improve the overall housing stock. Madam Speaker, assuming a mortgage interest rate of 7.5% and a repayment period of 20 years, the mortgage would, be, would have to be at least $337,000 to have interest payments exceed $25,000. This means that the majority of mortgage holders, new and existing, would benefit from this policy. This policy comes into effect 1st January 2015. Madam Speaker, many people have indicated that a major challenge they experience in, re in reduced purchasing power as prices of goods and services increase. We consider reducing the import duty on some products, but you may recall that in 2009, we sought to address this matter by removing the import duty on an extensive list of items. Time does not permit me to read that list, but simply to say that most basic items are already exempt from import duty. Therefore, Madam Speaker, government believes that the best way to bring direct relief to citizens is through a reduction in personal income tax, giving each employee more money in his or her pocket. <laughs> In that regard, Madam Speaker, effective 1st January 2015, the non-taxable allowance will be increased from $20,000 per annum to $25,000 per annum. As a result of this policy, anyone earning $25,000 and less per annum or $2,083 or less per month will not pay personal income tax. This equates to an additional 1,508 people who will no longer pay income tax in Dominica. 1,508 people will no longer pay income tax in Dominica, meaning 
every dollar earned will be in his pocket or her pocket. For those who will continue to pay tax, this measure also results in an overall reduction in the tax bill. For example, a person earning $2,500 per month is now paying $125 per month in income tax. With the increase in the non-taxable personal loans, the tax to be paid is estimated at $62.50. A person earning $3,500 per month is now paying $291.67 per month and will pay $212.50 per month with the change. A person earning $6,000 per month is now $933.43 per month and will pay $812.50 per month with a change. A person earning $10,000 per month I'm the bank managers here and everybody <laughs> per month is now paying $2,343.43 per month and will pay $2,187.50 per month with a change. Using the examples indicated above, for the public officer who earns $2,500 per month, the value of the benefit from this measure equates to the value of a 3% salary increase. <laughs> for the person who earns $6,000 per month, the value of the benefit equates to the value of a 2% salary increase. Madam Speaker, one can well appreciate the compounded nature of these measures. A taxpayer who benefits from this relief, along with the mortgage interest rate, will pay much less tax in Dominic. Overall, this change will cost the state $5.3 million. While this measure is largely intended to help families meet their needs, we believe that if it, if it results in greater satisfaction and productivity, the cost to the state will be less in relative than the amount I have just quoted. I therefore ask all employers in both the private and public sector to make this measure worthwhile. Madam Speaker, the package I have just presented does not mean that the state has no need of the revenue which has been given up. On the contrary, the state is interested in collecting all the revenue that is due to it so that it can adequately provide the goods and services to the citizens. In fact, Madam Speaker, I remind those who owe the state to meet the obligation. Since 2008, most countries have sought to provide some form of fiscal or economic stimulus. In Dominica, the focus has been on accelerating the implementation of the capital program financed largely by grants. The package I have just outlined goes one step further and is intended to facilitate more private sector investment and increased productivity. Madam Speaker, we are presenting a budget where there are no new taxes or no increased taxes. And when I listen to some people about the pronouncements, if they were to be in government today, you would talk about a 28.5 increase in taxes on the backs of people of Dominica to finance the spy in the sky projects and programs which they have enunciated in a place where shows are held. <laughs> so Madam Speaker, this government is working. We are working for the people of Dominica. The physical development in roads and other infrastructural infrastructure is plain for all to see. Our people are benefited from the jobs that have been created. The better roads make communication more pleasurable, faster, and economical. The sea and river defenses give comfort and a greater sense of safety to those who live in these areas. The new schools and college create a better environment for learning and imparting skill necessary for expansion of our economy. Indicators of human improvement, such as the increased number of trained people, are positive. This budget continues the tradition of this government of putting forward projects 
that will lift the face of this country, raise production, secure social safety nets, and provide employment. With the package of measures that I have de delivered, it goes one step further by providing direct relief to individuals and families and the large and small private sector firms. People-centered development is exposed by this government as it is articulated in the GSPS, ensuring that the environment is right for growth and for creating employment, all built on a foundation of strong fiscal management. I have no doubt, Madam Speaker, that this budget will impact positively on everyone in our, in our country and every household and every community in Dominica. As I close, Madam Speaker, I recognize the assistance and partnerships we have built with our bilateral and multilateral friends and express on the behalf of government and people of Dominica and on my own personal behalf our deepest gratitude to all our friends and partners. Your help has certainly helped us address a number of issues confronting our country and we look forward to this continued levels of bilateral and multilateral cooperation. I also wish to remind all of us that Dominica is ours to build. We must all join this working government in building this country. There's a role for all of us. In our father's house, there are many mansions. And in this government house, there are many rooms, many mansions, all of us. I trust that with God's guidance, we can all continue to make Dominica a better place. Madam Speaker, I want to thank all Dominicans for the continued support and to say to you that this government will spare no effort to continue to bring relief to every single household in this country. The task of advancing Dominica's development is not an easy one. There are many challenges and resources are scarce. But no one can say with any degree of honesty that this government has not transformed Dominica in the last 15 years. <laughs> and those who want to be on the opposition side, I know it pains them to say otherwise. And we have presented a budget once properly implemented, will continue to bring jobs to the people and greater and improved way of life for people. That's our commitment, Madam Speaker, and that's my commitment as a leader of this beautiful country, Dominic. May God bless all of us. May God bless this beautiful country, Dominic, and may God bless our efforts to continue advancing the development. I thank you for listening. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I move that the House be adjourned to July 24th at 10 a.m. Seconded, Madam Speaker. It moved. It has been moved and second. It has been moved and seconded that this honourable house be adjourned to to the 24th, which is tomorrow, at 10 a.m. Those in favour. Those against, the eyes have it. This honorable house stands adjourned until tomorrow at 10 a.m. <laughs>